Hey everyone, uh, I'm Frederick Kjelsta. I'm a, an assistant professor in the CS department at Stanford University. Uh, I work on compilers and programming models, uh, in particular for sparse uh, computations like sparse tensor algebra. Today I'm going to talk about software and hardware for sparse machine learning. But first, uh, we're all on board with machine learning being quite important, but why do we need sparsity in machine learning? So I'm going to argue that there's uh, basically two places where the sparsity comes from. One is that we try to increase the efficiency of the neural network by introducing sparsity into it. And the other is that uh, we want to train on and um, infer on sparse data. So first, um, uh, what you're seeing here uh, is um, a plot of the size of uh, large language models um, in number of parameters uh, going from 2017 through to 2022. What you're seeing here is an explosion in the size of these models. And along with that explosion comes an explosion in the cost of these models. We've heard anecdotal rumors that some of these large language models might be costing as much as $100 million or more to train and several cents, if not a few tens of cents, to infer, uh, to, provi uh, to uh, provide one answer using the language models. So we're interested in uh, sparse, uh, sparsity in these models to uh, both control the absolute cost, but also to control uh, how much uh, that the asymptotic factor as the model increases. We don't want uh, the cost to increase by n squared as the number of parameters goes up. The second reason uh, I mentioned is that we want to um, uh, do both training and inference on irregular and sparse data. Things like knowledge graphs, uh, social networks, meshes and point clouds. These are all data we have in our databases and we want to answer questions about them and we also want to provide predictions based on that data. So uh, first let me talk a little bit about model sparsity and let me give you three examples of where sparsity shows up in machine learning models. And the first is weight sparsity, which has been the, uh, the main way people looked at uh, up until uh, recently. So um, with weight sp sparsity, you have a weight matrix inside your neural network uh, and you attempt to prune out non-zeros from the matrix so as to make the matrix sparse. And if you aggressively prune out uh, non-zeros, then maybe you can get it uh, north of 95% sparse, maybe even north of 99% sparse. And even those sparse uh, methods have uh, an overhead. If you can make it sparse enough, they will be more efficient. So this has been um, uh, useful, uh, but it's only useful in giving you uh, maybe a factor of uh, two or three in, of, or up to five in performance improvements. Uh, Another way people have looked at that's maybe even more important than uh, weight sparsity is attention sparsity. So the main mechanism in uh, the large language models in these transformer designs is the attention mechanism uh, that were different uh, input tokens or input words if it's uh, inferring over a sentence uh, attend on different other input tokens. The problem with the attention mechanism in the original design uh, of the transformers is that uh, they grow m squared uh, with the size of the input uh, context. So that you give a sentence to ChatGPT, uh, the cost of uh, doing inference will be m squared with that sentence. So people have been uh, very interested in controlling that cost so that maybe you can provide a whole book as a prompt or even a whole corpus of books as a prompt to these models. But clearly you can't have an m squared a scaling factor if you're going to provide very large ends into the system. So uh, people, one of the ways people have been looking at for controlling that cost is to sparsify the attention matrix. You provide a mask matrix that uh, reduces uh, the attention so that only some tokens attend on each other. Uh, and uh, here you're seeing matrices from the Big Bird design uh, where some tokens attend on everything, that's the green. Uh, all the tokens attend to their neighbors, that's the blue. And then there's some random attention uh, to create a random graph so that the information can propagate through, uh, from different tokens to different other tokens. That's the orange. The third way I'm going to mention is a mixture of expert models, which are incredibly important for controlling uh, the, the size of the, uh, the cost of these uh, large language models. And this design is, uh, is gaining traction. Uh, what I'm showing is a figure from the Megablox paper by Trevor Gale and his uh, co-authors. Uh, where um, uh, he shows that you can uh, model uh, uh, an expert computation as a sparse matrix multiplication and thus not dropping tokens. 
So a mixture of experts, uh, they're often called sparsely gated mixture of experts. It's a form of sparsity. It's very, it's block sparsity. So you have dense blocks, but you have sparsity on the outside and you have to address that uh, uh, in your hardware and uh, also in your programming models. On the other hand, uh, that, uh, we have a lot of irregular and sparse data that we want to do uh, inference and training over. Uh, so for instance, uh, graphs such as social networks and other graphs, where we want to do a convolution over them. So that's a graph convolutional neural network. Uh, we have a lot of relational data where we might want to ask things like, uh, uh, does this person like this product or does this person like that movie? This is clearly the, um, uh, the, the most important things that companies that uh, depend on advertisement or depends on product sales care about. Uh, how much will someone like a product and can we then recommend that product to them? Or how much do they like an advertisement and can we recommend that to them? And the way a lot of these um, recommender systems work is that uh, you'll have an embedding uh, table for say all your customers on the left here, you'll have an embedding table for all your products. And when you want to calculate a rating, uh, you will, um, uh, so maybe you want to calculate how much Kim likes on the iPhone. You go and grab the embedding vector for Kim, you go and grab the embedding vector for the iPhone, you do an inner product of them, and then you uh, shove, shove that through some neural networks. So the sparsity here is that you have to do this random access as two different vectors, so, which you can think of multiplying them by a one-half vector or a multi-half vector. And you have to deal with that again in the programming model and in the hardware. And the third way is sequence locality. So in these large language models, uh, you have some locality in that some words are, are close to other words in English text. Uh, and uh, you can maybe take advantage of nearest neighbor uh, uh, locality in that word se sequence. Uh, of course, words depend on words far away in the sentence, but they might be special significant in the, uh, for the near words, which is what this big word model took advantage of. So, uh, uh, so that's uh, why we need sparse machine learning. Uh, and then let's look at the programming model landscape for machine learning. So for dense machine learning, we tend to use tensor frameworks like Torch, TensorFlow, and JAX. Uh, for sparse machine learning, uh, there are some sparse support in Torch, TensorFlow, and JAX, uh, but uh, uh, there's not much support. They support certain functions. Uh, JAX is building out more support, but it's not quite uh, uh, done yet. Uh, in sp uh, so, so these can be used for um, uh, sparse tensor computations. But then for graph neural networks, you have another set of libraries that have a graph abstraction. These are Pygeometric and, and DGL and so, so forth. Uh, and these um, uh, are designed to express uh, computations over graphs or graph neural networks, essentially. And then you have a third set of libraries, uh, such as LightFM uh, and TorchRec, which are built for um, recommender models. And what we think is that you can replace all of these libraries with just PyTorch, just the tensor computations. Uh, and we're building a library we call Scorch that can do that. So if you have sufficient support for sparse tensors, you have full support for it. So that you can apply any Python, PyTorch operation on dense and sparse um, tensors. And you have uh, appropriate compiler optimizations behind the, ski, uh, behind the scenes. We think you can uh, do both tensor computations, you can do the graph neural networks, and you can do recommender models and mixture of experts. You can do all of them in just plain vanilla PyTorch with this sparsity extension. So let me show you how that would look like. So, so here's a mixture of expert model implemented in a dense PyTorch. Uh, and um, since it's then py, dense PyTorch, uh, uh, the one hot vector that um, uh, indexes into a different expert will be a dense vector, which will cause some computation at each expert. So that's not great. So for this to be efficient, we have to uh, uh, make that one hot vector in the middle there sparse. So what we can do is we can replace PyTorch with uh, Scorch. And so we add sparse support to PyTorch and we're building this out. This is work in progress. And then we can just say two sparse on the one hot vector. Uh, and with that change, we've sparsified this mixture of expert models. So this is how we think the programming models should look like for a lot of sparse machine learning. It should just be dense and sparse tensor algebra with a good optimizations underneath. So um, uh, 
that brings us to the next question I mentioned, compilers for sparse tensor algebra. So why do we need compilers? Why can't we just write uh, library uh, routines uh, such as those in TensorFlow and then compose them together? Uh, and uh, my thesis here is that uh, it would not um, be possible to reduce sparse neural networks to a few handwritten functions. And there's two reasons for it. There's too many operations to do that. You can't, you can write a dozen functions, you can write a few hundred functions, you can't, can't write thousands of functions. Uh, and um, things like sparse loop fusion, where you fuse together computations through different tensor operations, can change, uh, can change the asymptotic complexity when the tensors are sparse. And I'll show you how both of these two things play out. So first, it's too many operations. So here's uh, a few expressions from the linear algebra and the tensor algebra. Here are some data structures you might want to use to store your tensors, including a dense matrix and different uh, types of um, sparse compressed schemes. Uh, and here are some machines you might want to run your operations on, on those data structures. And the Cartesian combination of all these expressions, and these are just a subset of the expressions, there's an infinite expression, number of expressions in, in principle. And these data structures and these machines become too much to write by hand. Uh, so that's why we need a compiler infrastructure. Uh, you could also imagine that we can just write out the binary expressions on some data structures, and then we can convert data structures, and we can convert compound expression to that set of handwritten expressions. The problem with that is that uh, sparse fusion can cause a change in the asymptotic complexity of your computation. So for instance, uh, let me give you an example. This is a computation that's very important in um, graph neural networks uh, and other places. Uh, in this computation, you have a, a dense matrix C that you multiply by a dense matrix D. In this example, that gives you 64 inner products. But then you element-wise that, uh, multiply that, uh, the result of CD by a sparse matrix B. And that this means that you sample from the space of that product. So um, if you need to compute this non-zero here, you have to do, uh, you have to multiply this non-zero by the inner product from CMD. But at the locations where the B matrix is sparse, you don't actually don't need to do any work. So if you first multiply those matrices and then sample, you would have done way too much work. Whereas if you fuse this together and only do the inner products you need, you can reduce in this example, the 64 inner products to just 10 inner products. And here you see the performance difference across the matrices from the sweet sparse matrix repository. And, um, and uh, as you can see, the performance difference is huge uh, in tens of thousands of X. And, and this is just showing you an asymptotic difference uh, in uh, either computing all the inner products or just computing those inner products for which the sparse matrices have a non-zero. So there's no question you have to fuse these oper operations together. And since this specific operation is very important uh, in machine learning, every library that uh, does this operation provides a custom uh, hand-optimized implementation of this specific tree uh, operand expression. And you can do that for this expression, but you can't do it as, uh, for, for uh, an arbitrary number of such fused expressions. So you'd like compiled technology and the need to hood there. So, um, Here's the difference in asymptotic complexity, by the way. So uh, what kind of compiler design do we want? Uh, so we've been building out sparse tensor, algebra compiler, uh, sparse tensor algebra compiler technology for a while. And here's the design we've landed on. So you have a compiler. Uh, the input to the compiler are, sparse, uh, are tensor operations that don't care if the tensor is sparse or dense. They just operate on tensors. Then separately from that, you want to be able to describe for every tensor in your uh, operations, what the data structure of that tensor is. So that can be a dense array or it can be a sparse uh, compressed data structure. Then you want a third specification that describes the optimizations you want to apply to compute that tensor operation on those data structures. And then uh, you want to uh, automate those optimizations. So you can have a person provide an optimization description, uh, often called a schedule, uh, but you would like to build an op automatic scheduler or automatic optimizer that decides what optimizations to apply because a normal machine learning person will not uh, want to uh, specify how their code should be optimized at uh, the granularity of loop optimizations. Then um, 
uh, you want to be able to compile to CPUs, you want to be able to compile to GPUs, you want to be able to compile to fixed function hardware. So if you have a dense block you uh, uh, and you're multiplying it by another dense block, you should be able to run that on a TPU. Uh, you should be able to use vector instructions and so forth. Uh, you want to be able to target uh, programmable data flow hardware that's reconfigurable, such as the Sambanova chips uh, or other chips we're building at Stanford, where you can maybe have one chip be able to do all of the sparse tensor algebra, not just matrix multiplications. Uh, and then you want to be able to um, uh, map your operations to distributed machines. And you want to be able to mix these kind of hardware so you can take advantage of the hardware that's in your data center. So we have done a bunch of work uh, across these different uh, areas. There's still a bunch of work left to be done. Uh, so I, I hope some of you will be interested uh, in, uh, in engaging with this sort of work. And here are uh, here's uh, papers written by other people than us. So uh, there's a community of people working on uh, these sort of things. Okay, so let me give you a little intuition to how the compilation works for just CPUs. So the first thing you want to do uh, is have a uh, data model for the, the data structures of the tensors. So here's a matrix. Uh, you can think of that matrix as a coordinate tree where the different I coordinates connect to the J coordinates on the rows, uh, on those I rows. Uh, then you can start to apply different data structure at each level in this coordinate hierarchy. So this means that you uh, say different data structure for different tensor dimensions. So maybe I make that first uh, level dense, and then I make the second level compressed, and now I have a, a sparse data structure. So let me show you how that works out. So here's a sparse matrix. If I want to store that matrix dense, I just need to know... Um, uh, so if I um, uh, make the first dimension of that matrix dense, just store the number 3, uh, and then I make a compressed dimension, now I have the CSR data structure for sparse matrices. Uh, if I make the first dimension compressed and I make the second dimension a singleton, then I get the coordinates of COO uh, uh, sparse matrix format. So you can compose different per dimension data structures into uh, uh, many different types of uh, tensor data structures. So this clearly generalizes to higher order tensors because you're doing it per dimension. And then the compiler will absorb this. So the way you can compile code is you start with uh, just the loops, just like you would in a dense tensor algebra compiler, but the loop bounds are set expressions instead of being arranged from 0 to n. So the, the k loop, for instance, iterates over the, the, tensor B, the matrix B and the, the matrix C in this matrix matrix multiplication. So you have to do the intersection of those two because zero is annihilated by, um, multiplication is annihilated by 0. And then you can add in a similar set uh, loop bounds for the other loops. And then you wanna, uh, when you want to generate code, what you're intuitively doing in that code is that you're iterating over these coordinate hierarchies. You're specifically iterating over data structure, but think abstractly here as iterating over these coordinate hierarchies. So you have to iterate all the, uh, the i's in B and then uh, intersect them with the universe of all coordinates because that matrix is replicated across another other matrix. Uh, but we can optimize that away. Then you want to uh, need to iterate over the intersection of the k-coordinates in B and the k-coordinates in C. And finally, for each coordinate that survives that intersection, you need to iterate over the j-coordinates in C. And um, uh, you can generate the code loop by loop. And we have a, a co-iteration generation machinery that can generate uh, intersections of different types of data structures, can generate unions if, you, if you're adding tensors together of different kinds of data structures. Uh, our uh, co-iteration, uh, code generation machinery can also generate um, uh, set combinations of any number of tensors. So you can fuse tensors together by co-iterating. You can fuse tensor operations together by co-iterating across many different types of tensors. It can deal with, um, with left joins and uh, other kind of iteration patterns that might show up in nonlinear functions. Uh, and here's an XOR iteration pattern. I want to briefly tell you a little bit about the hardware for machine learning as well. So at this point, a, a pretty conventional design for a machine learning accelerator uh, looks something like this. You have some control, sort of control processor on a chip. Then you have a large systolic array for doing the matrix uh, computations. So these are dense matrix computations. 
then maybe you have a set of vector processors that can do nonlinear functions and any uh, operation that you don't have specialized hardware for. And then um, uh, you're starting to see more and more designs like the TPU V4 uh, described uh, this year in a paper uh, where you have some sort of sparse core that can fetch, uh, can do indirect memory accesses and fetch a bunch of sparse data. To further reduce uh, the, the cost of uh, executing sparse tensor algebra computations, you might want to move to a, sp a reconfigurable sparse data flow uh, hardware. So let me tell you a little bit about the sparse uh, abstract machine that my uh, student Olivia Xu and collaborators uh, worked on. So in this machine, uh, you have um, data flow primitives for the different uh, parts, of the different things you need to do in sparse tensor algebra. So you have level scanners that can be composed hierarchical to iterate uh, over uh, sparse tensors and stream them into wires. Uh, then uh, you have various machinery like um, intersection blocks uh, and uh, locate blocks uh, to be able to co-iterate over multiple sparse data structures, uh, uh, again on the wires of this uh, data flow hardware. Uh, the hardware has support for broadcasting through a repeater block that for each coordinate in one tensor can repeat, uh, repeatedly load all the coordinates from another tensor. So this gives you broadcasting and uh, uh, tensor algebra expressions. And then finally, you need to do scalar computations. So as you can see, most of this hardware is about uh, streaming through and pre-processing data. Uh, so here you see um, uh, an inner product sparse matrix multiplication implemented in this hardware. Uh, this is an asymptotically bad implementation of sparse matrix multiplication where you're doing asymptotically too much work. Uh, so by just flipping some of the primitives around, we can uh, generate the Gustafsson's algorithm that does asymptotically less work but needs a vector workspace. So that's all I have to say today. Yeah, so I hope I convinced you that, uh, uh, that sparse machine learning is uh, something worth looking at and that um, uh, un uh, unlike dense uh, neural networks that can uh, mostly be reduced to a gem primitive, a matrix, dense matrix multiplication, for sparse neural networks, we're going to need a lot more than one optimized function. So we need compilers and we need to be looking at the general hardware. Thank you.